Of course, you all know the story of Gulliver, right? And uh, this fellow was a big man compared to the, the small Lilliput fellows who are all here. And what happened is when he, uh, when his boat crashed and he landed in the, in the on the beach, uh, when he really came to his senses, he found that he cannot get up. He could not get up because he has been tied with so many of these. Uh, his hair was tied and tied it up here so that he, so many contacts were made. And these people tied it up in such a way that he cannot get up. That means what happens to a molecule in a crystal is this is exactly what, what happens. Because of the crystal forces, the interactions that are involved between molecules and so on, the weak bondings, which are essentially the way in which they have tied his hair here, for example, these are now the strong, medium, and weak interactions. And uh, weak interactions essentially occupy the intermolecular space. So since we are talking about the modeling that we can do for the molecule as a whole now, in terms of multiple refinements as well as uh, the Hirschfeld atom surfaces, it should be possible, therefore, to look into or take a peep into the intermolecular space. If we look into the intermolecular space, we will be left with a certain amount of electron density. And this electron density is crucial to keep the molecule in its position, which is defined by our loss which we have formed in this course, the symmetry, and also keep it in that particular space group. So the way in which uh, this is tied up, uh, this, this fellow is tied up, can be modified and you may have a different way of tying up molecules in diff with using different interactions. Then the crystal structure will change and so you can get polymorphic modifications. So essentially, the weak and strong interactions, therefore, based on energy criteria, can actually be analyzed if we do the charge density analysis. Here is an example, a very quick example. Now we go through quick examples because of uh, lack of time. Uh, we will, we have to wind the, wind the course one day and then I thought we will stress essentially on some weak interactions which look very, very critical and crucial for understanding the weak interactions and their importance. So here is a structure of ferulic acid. It was solved long, long ago and it has very strong hydrogen bonds. We are not worried about the strong hydrogen bonds because they arrest the molecules in their positions corresponding to the unit cell requirements and also the symmetry requirements. But in addition to the fact that they are located, interacting this way, we find some additional interactions which are essentially of the type CHO. There is a lot of initial discussion about whether CHO can be a hydrogen bond or not because the polarization that is associated with the carbon atom is minimal. So whether CHO interactions exist at all was a question. And if it does exist, does it follow the hydrogen bonding features like directionalities? Because a very strong hydrogen bond will have this angle 180 degrees. And uh, this particular angle, let me show that correctly. <coughs> the angle CHO will be 180 degrees for a very, very strong hydrogen bond. And normally such bonds do exist in crystal structures where we have, for example, carboxylic acid dimers. Uh, carboxylic acid dimers ensure very strong hydrogen bonds. So whether CHO will have such an interaction was discussed and finally with a lot of arguments involving crystal engineering principles, it was arrived at that CHO can be called a hydrogen bond. Now our interest is that can this CHO really hold the molecules together and what is the energy that is associated with it, if we can analyze that in terms of the charge density analysis. So we have looked into this region where are three possible CHO hydrogen bonds. The lengths and the angles are given here and we wanted to see the distribution of electron density in this. When we analyze the distribution of electron density in this, as I told that ferulic acid is held by a very strong carboxylate uh, hydrogen bond. This decides the orientation of the molecules in the crystal, essentially. This is at the center of symmetry of the crystal. And so we have this very strong hydrogen bonds and the strength of it is minus 47.48 kilocalories per mole. 
Uh, this calculation has been done based on charge density analysis. I am not going into the detail of it, but essentially you see it is a very, very strong bond. The larger is the negative, it is stronger it is. Okay. Then in addition to that, there is a between the two molecules, there is a strong, reasonably strong OHO hydrogen bond. And then of course, there is a simple CHO bond with the methyl group. So, we have calculated the energies for all these. This work was done by again Sajesh Thomas uh, in our group along with Pawan. Uh, these two these two gentlemen graduated of, out of my group recently. Uh, see the, you see that when you consider the energy that is associated with this trifurcated CHO bond, there are three bonds. You know this is the Gulliver idea. See if Lilliputs can tie him down with many, many such small interactions, this is exactly what it does. So, these two molecules are now tied down with these very weak interactions. They are weak individually, but collectively they generate an energy which is minus 15.87, much, much higher than uh, the energy that is involved in a typical OHO bond. So, one would think that a typical OHO bond would be stronger. In, in fact, it is stronger than CHO. But the case that these three together, the, the, uh, uh, the handshake between these three essentially holding it together will, is the so called Gulliver effect of weak interaction. So, we call this as the Gulliver effect of weak interactions and uh, this is how we could analyze the lone pair directionality is in the relative strengths of CHO interactions. So, this is one example where charge density analysis can be done. In fact, uh, at this stage we also did a little earlier on in fact, uh, one of my students Munshi, uh, he analyzed the all possible hydrogen bonds and also all possible bonds which are in the van der Waal interaction region. That means hardly any interactions between them and he calculated the electron density from the available data in literature and we had a very reasonably large number of such uh, available interactions. So, we find that uh, we have interactions like for example, NHO, OHO and NHO, these are representing strong hydrogen bonds. So, we found that there is a universal curve between the way in which electron density occurs and this Rij now is the region between one atom center and another atom center. It is not the straight line which is joining the bond, but this is known as the bond path. This is the path the electron density will take. So, if the epsilon value is larger, the path will be bent. If the epsilon value is very, very small, the path will be straight. So, depending upon the value of the uh, ellipticity associated with the bond, we find that Rij value can be determined. So, this is a universal curve where you see that the interactions are involved in these. For example, I will discuss a little bit on sulfur sulfur um, in a minute, but uh, these kind of interactions also have an electron density. This is the electron density plot electron density value. So, they do have some electron density and they all cluster around this region. So, much that we can now actually think of uh, drawing a line at 2.75 angstroms for Rij, which we would like to call as a limit of a hydrogen bond. So, anything beyond this is not a hydrogen bond and anything before this is a hydrogen bond and it could be classified into weak and strong hydrogen bond. And the straw, the, in fact, you see the very strong hydrogen bonds go up to a distance of one point. This is in oxalic acid dihydrate. The hydrogen bond is the strongest. It also tells us one other feature that is if you now keep this, this is going asymptotically uh, towards the infinity. That means it is going parallel to more or less parallel to the electron density vector. But as we keep going higher and higher, if we go through the end of this one and go further, we will get the other types of normal bonds we will get the covalent bond, the ionic bonds and so on. So, any bonding therefore, in, uh, in general uh, has this continuum. So, that means when two atoms come closer, they come closer to the van der Waal interaction region, they are happy to stay there. If they are happy to stay there, they will be in this region. If there is a weak interaction, it will stay in this region and if there is a strong interaction, they will stay in that region. And the even stronger like covalent bonds, ionic bonds and so on, they go through and to the other side of this uh, projection. They will go into the room away from me. But they will all follow this curve which is a universal curve. So, we call it as the continuum of strong hydrogen bonds to weak interactions. With this, we could also define uh, the radius of the hydrogen bond. Uh, I do not think I have time to go into those details, 
except to go to the next one where I talked about sulfur sulfur bond. This is something which by chance was done by me in 1981. So, uh, what I will do in the next 15 20 minutes, having made you sit through this entire course over the last so many days, I think I will highlight the work which has been done in our group on charge densities. Uh, th this is something of a propaganda for our group as well as something which which has been done in India for the first time and also there are not many groups in India who are doing this kind of work. And this is the, uh, this is some kind of a basis for the futuristic uh, outlook of quantum crystallography. So, I thought I will generally discuss the work which has come out from our group and probably it will take another 10 minutes at the most. So, uh, what I will do is here is what is done here is the we have looked into all crystal structures. You see, this is 1981. There were not too many structures, but whatever structures were available in the Cambridge structural database, we looked at it and found looked at it and found out that shorter distances between sulfur and sulfur. So there is there are molecules which have sulfur atoms on them, and these sulfurs now come due to the crystallography interactions, the symmetry and so on. They come closer. But when they come closer, what kind of interaction develops between them? This is purely van der Waal in nature. But does it give any indication of what is the nature of sulfur atom? See, so I mentioned a couple of days ago about the, in the pre couple of day classes ago, the importance of this year. It's the year of uh, periodic table. So sulfur is a very crucial element in the periodic table. Now we assume that the radius of sulfur is so much. But it shows in this particular way of analyzing, we see that the radius of sulfur is no longer spherical, it has, it has got a non-spherical shape. The reason is that whenever there is an atom which is approaching in this direction, which is in fact a nucleophile approaching sulfur, if the other sulfur is a, is a part of a molecule which makes it look like a nucleophile. So the approach of uh, the nucleophile to this sulfur atom is concentrated in the open circles and uh, the concentration of the closed circles will tell us that it is approaching from a direction which is about 20 degrees to the normal. This is the approach of the electrophiles and this is the approach of the nucleophiles. So effectively when you take a sulfur atom, it is not a hard sphere. Sulfur atom is now ready to accept electrons and give out electrons as well. And so now like it is more like you know you put a uh, you 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 have a pomegranate and you uh, put a hole through the pomegranate so pomegranate hole and you press the pomegranate it compresses in that direction okay when it compresses in the direction the overall shape of pomegranate is going to change and that's what happens to every atom not just the sulfur atom and therefore there are interaction regions which develop and these interaction regions have been theoretically calculated and those interaction regions are uh, the so-called sigma holes and uh, pi, pi holes. We do not have time to go into the detail of it, but those can be characterized uh, from the quantum mechanical calculations as well as from charge density measurements of very highly accurate data sets. In the, at this particular time, there were not many accurate data sets available, but we could predict that the sulfur, inter sulfur interactions will generate non-spherical shape of sulfur in crystals. Uh, this is something which is uh, just out of the hat kind of explanation in those days, but then this defined the so-called bonding in groups, all groups of atoms of 14 to 17. So the, at the groups 14 to 17 are shown here. Uh, we have therefore the carbon atom, we have the nitrogen atom, we have the oxygen atom and the fluorine. This now belongs to the halogen group. This belongs to the uh, sulfur group that is the chalcogen group. This belongs to the nicogen group and this belongs to the carbon group. So the, all these atoms now will have therefore a behavior which is like what we described in case of the sulfur. So the non-spherical shape is associated with every one of these elements in the periodic table and therefore they can have these kind of uh, directed interactions. And these directed interactions come as a consequence of what we have defined here. Uh, for example, a halogen bond, uh, it is a definition which has been accepted by all these crystal engineering community as well as charge density community. That is the definition, a halogen bond occurs when there is evidence of a net attractive interaction between an electrophilic region associated with a halogen atom in a molecular entity 
and a nucleophilic region in another or the same molecular entity. I think this uh, part is cut, I will just try to see. So, you see this is the definition a halogen bond of <laughs> I moved this one away just a second. <laughs> it is okay, it happens when you give uh, ok, let us small make it smaller. Right. So, yeah, this is the definition a halogen bond occurs when there is evidence of a net attractive interaction between an electrophilic region associated with a halogen bond. So, we are now concentrating on halogen bonds and this diagram clearly shows you that there is a donor and then there is an acceptor. Donor can be any of these atoms, acceptors or halogens and the value of the y atom could be again carbon, nitrogen, halogen. So, it could be anything. So, the halogen bonding occurs between these which is now shown as a something which is ready to open mouth and gulp this part and then this association takes place. And this was further characterized uh, theoretically by uh, uh, a remarkable work of uh, Politzer uh, who actually found out these kind of regions where now bromine in a CF3Br situation is now exhibiting what is known as a sigma hole. And this uh, sigma hole is uh, something which now tells us that this bromine is ready uh, to have this sigma hole behavior and ready to accept interactions. So, the interactions will develop in that region. So, they become highly directional. So, halogen bonding is highly directional, chalcogen bonding is highly directional. In fact, uh, we have also demonstrated uh, the nicogen bonding involving nitrogen is also a highly directional interaction. All these carry these uh, issue of uh, uh, sigma hole and things like that. This was extended in the case of halogen halogen bonding. This was the work of uh, Venkatesha who did this work and calculated the energies that are involved and showed that in different kinds of geometrical situations we can show the sigma hole. This by the way these are not orbitals as one they look like, but they are not orbitals. These are 3 D deformation density maps. So, in fact, uh, one cannot see the electron in one cannot see the orbitals because orbital is a quantum mechanical phenomena. So, at one time people thought that they are looking at orbitals, but they are not realistically orbitals, they are orbital, they are deformation density as three dimensional deformation density map. So, you can see that there is a sigma hole here which is now facing the electron dense annulus region which is blue. So, the red blue portion interacts with the blue portion and that is how you get an interaction between C L 1 and C L 2 in this particular case. So, there are other examples which have been worked out as far as uh, then came the realistic uh, understanding of this uh, sigma hole and then the, the bonding features. Uh, when uh, the work is uh, purely from IAC this uh, theoretical prediction was made by Professor Arunan of IPC the inorganic physical chemistry department. See, there is always this uh, hydrophobic interactions which occur and how do they occur? Because we already have a tetrahedrally satisfied uh, four bonds with carbon. This, so, that means it is a very stable atom. Still a nucleophile can attack on this one and we can form the so called SN2 reactions. So, the basis of SN2 reactions tells us that we can have interactions where we can have a hole of the carbon exposed for possible interaction profile. So, what was predicted by Arunan was the fact that he proposed what is known as a carbon bond. It is in analogy with hydrogen bond and halogen bond and he said that for example, in these three cases which were theoretically calculated, the theoretically he found find the uh, presence of finds the presence of the uh, critical point which is shown as a green dot here. So, the green dots are critical points. And if since you find a critical point by definition we gave it defines a bond and therefore, there is a short interaction in this particular case it is a FHO hydrogen bond. In this case it is a FClO halogen bond and in this particular case you have a carbon and you see that the oxygen atom now has a bond path which is shown like that. So, it is not going to be an interaction associated with these hydrogen atoms and then coming in which would be a CHO bond. It is essentially a direct interaction that means, the carbon atom now has opened out its sigma hole 
and this interaction is now accepted and that, that is the reason why you get a fifth bond with carbon because there are already four bonds. The fifth bond with carbon now becomes reactive and so you proceed with the reaction. So, this was the prediction which was made and then we wanted to verify it experimentally. So, we made two compounds. One compound which was we had already studied had this uh, short interaction between chlorine and carbon which is 3.25 and there was another case which we designed so that we have this um, carbon oxygen distance of 3.02. This again is the work of Thomas, uh, suggest Thomas and Pavan. So, uh, there are two possibilities. One possibility is the definition of carbon bonding which is given by Arunan. The other possibility is the trifurcated hydrogen bond CHO, right. So, A is being the acceptor atom in this particular one case it is chlorine, the other case it is oxygen, agreed. So, uh, what we did was to do the charge density analysis and plot the deformation densities. What is found is that in the case of the first compound which is phenobam we find that it is actually going to the hydrogen atom. The bond path when we calculate the critical point is up here and the bond path goes to the hydrogen atom, nothing exciting. So, this is essentially a CHO. On the other hand in this compound DMA4HBA, we see that this now goes to the carbon atom directly, avoiding the three hydrogen atoms which are readily looking for it. You know it is like uh, in cricket, there are three slips and a gully and somebody pushes the ball between the two slips. So, which one is, which fellow is going to catch it? Uh, of course, uh, nowadays Indian team has improved their performance. Otherwise, what will happen is if the ball goes between the second slip and the third slip, both of them dive on each other and the ball escapes. But it may so happen that one of them may catch the ball. So, in this particular case, this fellow caught the ball which is nothing exciting which is a allowed interaction but this is an interaction which we were looking for. So, effectively if you see this carbon now, it has 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 bonds and that for it is an intermediate to a possible reaction site. So, we found for the first time the uh, bond path which represents the carbon atom and we were, we almost forgot it but then it became very famous, it came in C and D news. So, the last part of the course I thought we will give some publicity to my group. So, this came in C and D news, it became very famous. People said we defined a new carbon bond and electronic effects that produce halogen bonds yield non-covalent interactions in other elements and so on and so forth. And there is a big paragraph written about what we have done in this case. Sigma hole bonds are also highly directional and occur in line with the covalent bond that causes them. So, again the universal plot which we did in 2003 is verified even in this particular case. So, this was uh, quite an excitement at that time. The next excitement came with uh, a title which we see here sigma meets pi for a whole lot of bonding and this was the work done by Rumpa uh, in our group uh, with me and then we, we find that in this particular case it is a, it is a it is uh, a compound of a compound which is biologically important and uh, there, there is a SCN uh, bond, it is a linear bond and then there is an interaction between the sulphur and the center of this NSC bond, NCS bond and also there is a center interaction. So, it is its space group is uh, P41 and so it is quite an interesting organic molecule and when we analyze this structure we had some interesting phase transitions, I do not want to touch upon that, but what we found is that in one direction it has the sigma hole interaction dominates and in the other direction the pi hole interaction dominates. So, one goes this way forward direction sigma hole and the other goes from the perpendicular direction which is the pi hole. And uh, then of course, uh, uh, Jason uh, who is a editor of uh, chemistry world, he wrote that uh, we, we found the cooperative sigma hole and pi hole responsible for holding molecules in an isothiocyanate based peptide. So, uh, this compound of course, uh, we got from uh, Professor Balaram's group. Uh, so, this uh, work was praised again truly smashing and adds considerable scientific value to bond theory. This was written by uh, one of the pioneers in charge density analysis, Dietmar Stalke and uh, the, the thereby we essentially see that uh, a typical X-ray diffraction experiment with of course, uh, a little more analysis using quantum crystallography 
providing chemical bonding characteristics, crystal dynamics, etc. And it gives uh, various ideas about how to go further is, uh, is emerging. So um, again, the rules of symmetry play a major role. The way in which the sigma hole orientation takes place depends upon where the symmetry element is located in the atomic arrangement. It also depends upon where the, uh, where, how many molecules are there in the unit cell and in what way the molecules direct themselves uh, with involving these very, very weak interactions. These are all very, very small in terms of electron densities. Unless you do a very high resolution X-ray diffraction data, you can't see them experimentally. And then, of course, theoretical modeling is also equally difficult, but when once uh, the modeling is done, there is a nice handshake. This is the only area where there is, for once, the theoreticians and the experimentalists shake hands and agree with each other. Uh, normally, theoreticians are always thinking they are somewhere above space and they are doing wonderful work. Experimentalists are very humble and they say, well, we have found this. But this is the first time when experimentalists are dictating the theoreticians and vice versa. So this is therefore an area of future and you see that improved structure determination in protein crystallography, we are looking for that. Determination of hydrogen atom positions, hydrogen ADPs is already possible and modeling of accurate. See this part uh, which, is, which we should have discussed a little more when we had time uh, is essentially depends upon the way in which the atoms are and the way in which the atoms are interacting with each other and the way in which molecules are put inside the crystal. So again, uh, the symmetry probably will add on to the contributions of modeling electron density distributions. We don't know. The issues associated with symmetry, if they are brought along with the concept of modeling, uh, that will definitely help. In fact, the multipole model also, when we do the expansion uh, about um, monopole, dipole, quadrupole and so on, depending upon the symmetry of the system, uh, some of the values associated with these polar components will either appear or disappear, effectively like systematic absences. So uh, there won't be any contribution coming in certain directions because of the fact that there is symmetry that is associated with the crystal structure. So that way the study of symmetry uh, at the basic level which we have done in the entire course and then the way in which we have carried out uh, the understanding of uh, the development of point groups, uh, the space groups, the systematic absences through experiments and the type of experiments we perform using X-ray diffraction. And at the later stage when we have looked at the accuracies with which we can analyze the results and then the re-squares refinement, the powder diffraction, all these in a nutshell are a part and parcel of the basic understanding of symmetry and structure in the solid state. And I think in this particular course, we have been able to cover that aspect to a reasonable extent. We have, we have expanded this into the recent areas. We have seen many potential applications that are possible. Uh, but since it is a short course of this kind, we cannot go into the detail of that. So maybe there is an advanced course which will now use the ideas which you have learned from this short course and then go to the advanced course where you will learn more details of all these methodologies, uh, which again requires the basic understanding of symmetry and structure. So symmetry and structure is the foundation for any of these uh, discussions we have had until now. So I say this, I, I, I always like to say something at the end of a lecture and this, uh, like this uh, series of talks, this series of classes never ends because it has to go on and on and on. This is a statement from Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings. He says that the road goes ever on and on. This is what we came from, structure and symmetry. We went to various directions. Down from the door where it began. It began at a point. It began with what? It began with the definition of point groups. And it began at a point center of symmetry. It then went to a two-fold symmetry. It went to the planes and so on. Now far ahead the road has gone. So we have gone far away in those directions. We, we have understood all the symmetry principles and so on. And I must follow if I can. This is the problem. I must follow these. Whatever I have understood, I must follow. Pursuing it very feet, obviously, because we have learned so many things. I have talked for so long. In fact, uh, I have coughed many times. Some of it may be recorded also. 
So uh, it went on and on. It's, it's quite very to go through this until it joins some larger way. Now, finally, we have put them all together. We are, we are looking at very finer aspects of uh, uh, the small molecule structure determination, bringing quantum chemistry into the picture. Uh, of course, we have not seen the other aspect of uh, large molecules. That is also very fascinating. So there are two major developments in the last uh, decade or so. One is understanding small molecules to the best possible extent. We, for the first time, we are seeing holes in atoms in the periodic table in a loose sense. We have identified the sigma holes and the pi holes associated with atoms and how they provide electrophilic and nucleophilic interactions. So uh, pursuing it with very price until it joins a larger way, where many paths and errands meet. So all these things, sigma hole meets pi hole, something we wrote, uh, that fellow wrote, I didn't write. And whether then, I cannot say. So we, we are reached the main road now. Now after reaching the main road, what we will do, whether we will take a taxi, we will take a bus, we will take a bullock cart, I don't know, petrol is getting over in this world, so we may even end up with a bullock cart. But whatever, we cannot say right now. And that is the statement of Lord of the Rings with which I will end this uh, course. And I must acknowledge, because I have just r left and right copied the beautiful equations and diagrams which are there in these textbooks. Uh, I don't know how to thank these guys because unless I had these books at my disposal and of course, uh, you know, uh, copyright issues being violated left and right these days, so uh, I, I could get the scanning done and get the diagrams out. So many of the diagrams are taken directly from these books. And so I thought I should acknowledge all the people who wrote those books. They are wonderful books. Uh, for example, this one, The Fundamentals of Crystallography, uh, which is edited by Gye Kwa uh, But you see there are so many high quality authors who have contributed to this. This is a more recent book published by uh, UCR. The Oxford University Press brought it out, Oxford Science Publications. So you, you can see that all the modern methods uh, of structure determination are covered here. So this is the most recent book. One of the older books is The Essentials of Crystallography, Duncan McKee and Christian, uh, Christine McKee. Uh, these two have written a wonderful book. This is probably the best book to understand symmetry. If anyone wants to get a complete understanding of how symmetry develops, what are the various symmetry elements in terms of both physics as well as chemistry. I have not gone into the detail of how mathematically we can come to these understanding of point groups and space group, but that is an issue uh, which is not for our course. So, uh, but we could have, uh, one could study uh, the, the group theory associated with it and still arrive at all the details. But this is a book we must, I must acknowledge, this is by far the uh, most referred book in our course. The other is uh, the Guru's book. This is Jack Dunnett's, uh, I consider him my Guruji because he is the one who explained all the scattering phenomena. Uh, in such a way that a very simple person like me can understand the entire structure, I mean entire uh, scattering theory. So whatever scattering theory we did and how we arrived at the uh, Bragg condition and uh, the uh, Lave conditions and so on were all taken from this textbook of Jack Dennett's. And then we have got the other three books. The next book of course is uh, the X-ray Structure Determination Practical Guide. Stout and Jensen, as the title says, it is a practical guide. So most of the tables which we have in the presentation are from the textbook, uh, which tells you how to get the equivalent points, how to generate the equivalent diagrams, how to get the symmetry points and then the equivalent points and so on. Then of course the book of uh, the crystal structure analysis, uh, which is now one of the current books which are in which are available in many bookshops and this is a this is for the modern day crystallographers who use the machines uh, who don't have to learn too much of crystallography but depend on the machines but having depended on the machines what are the principles and practice one has to go through for crystal structure analysis is beautifully compiled in this it's again this is edited by william clegg uh, so this has articles by, by many of the top crystallographers currently uh, in the world. So this is another textbook which, is, which we have referred to. It's also an IUCR textbook. 
and then of course uh, the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the Quran or whatever it is. Uh, the, that is our international tables for crystallography. Now without this uh, the course could not have been done at all and the contents of this uh, book, the tables have been displayed many, many times and we have discussed every point with respect to the international tables of crystallography. And so I think I am very grateful to the availability of these, these six textbooks and the tables without which the course could not have been completed. I come to the end of the uh, course now with a last slide. The last slide is very crucial uh, because if you want to do something like this, you need the help of people. Right, and I have got some four mug shots of four guys uh, who are people who are in my group. Uh, Deepthi Kanta Swain uh, he is a postdoc, and uh, Titas, Ajana, and Ravi. In fact, these four fellows will continue to be with you during the TA programs and also the monthly discussion programs and so on throughout the course. And of course, IASC, without which we can't do this, uh, NPTEL is also situated. They have an office in IAC, and if any time you are there, you can see that this is a very beautiful symmetric building surrounded by, of course, a lot of nature around it. But if you look at it carefully, you can see the symmetry that is associated with the main building. I, as a challenge, I want you to find the symmetry associated with this at the end of the course. I also thank all my other postdocs and project assistants who now participated very actively in this course program and also helped me out to make some corrections here and there, particularly English corrections. And I, at the end, I would like to thank you all for participating in the course.